Today, I'm going to give you my unsolicited, marginally informed opinions on artificial intelligence. First of all, let's get this out of the way. If you haven't seen my video about is AI art copyrightable, then we need to go over something really quickly that I think everybody needs to understand about artificial intelligence. The number one thing that people just don't get, it is not intelligence. It is artificial. It is not even remotely intelligence. Artificial intelligence is really, it's this term that was coined decades ago, back when the whole idea was in its infancy. It's this science fiction-y term, but a lot of the actual artificial intelligence discussion originally was science fiction. It was about things like cyborgs or robots that could, uh, that could think and that basically were a life form unto themselves. What we call artificial intelligence today is really just machine learning. That's it. That, that's all there is to it. It's, it's just machine learning. There's no, there's not some kind of amazing, like, description to it. it it's, it's just an algorithm. A sophisticated algorithm, but an algorithm nonetheless. That you teach by throwing information at it. It's not really being taught, though, is it? You're just showing it... The, the reason that it's difficult for me to explain what artificial intelligence is, is that it's not s simple enough for me to just break down into some kind of, like, one-line description. You know, there's no artificial intelligence elevator pitch. Um, I don't have some quick, brief introduction, but <clears throat> to give you a simplified example of artificial intelligence, and just if you can imagine it scaled up, you basically have things like stable diffusion or uh, whatever. Pick your AI, it doesn't matter. Thunderbird, the mail client. My mail client. I love it until they ruined the interface, but uh, I've got it locked to like version 102, so I'm on the older interface, which is not completely crapped. Actually, I'm still on like. Thunderbird 57 or something, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the bottom line is Thunderbird has a junk mail filtering system. This junk mail filtering system uses heuristics. They gather information about each piece of mail that is received, and they assign weights to the pieces of information that they gather. If Viagra appears in an email, is that email spam? Well, you and I would say yes, but a computer doesn't know that. And the goal is to get the computer to know that. So we teach the computer that Viagra is spam by marking a bunch of emails as spam that, that happen to have that word in it. But that's not actually how a computer learns how to do things like spam filtering. Um, it, it, you, you don't just be like, this email bad, no more like this. When you teach a computer um, a spam filter to filter spam, it is analyzing the content and assigning weight to the content. So if you mark five messages as spam and all five messages have the word Viagra in them, the word Viagra gets weighted towards the probably spam very strongly. <clears throat> the system actually starts to learn by assigning weights to things that it sees are present or absent and in certain sequences and so on, the system begins to learn this is probably spam, this is probably not spam. And if you mark something as not spam, it does the same thing in, in except in the other direction. Instead of like starting at 0.5 and going up to mark it as spam, like this this is in here, it's obviously spam, it marks it down, so it might go down to 0.4 instead of 0.5. So marking as not spam pushes the weights down, marking as spam pushes the weights up. Things that occur more often in spam emails will, will start to uh, get weighed higher and higher towards the is spam side of things. And it's got real dark real fast, let me brighten things up. Uh, that's as bright as it goes. Um, 
but they'll get pushed up towards the is spam uh, side of things and things that aren't get pushed down. This is a simplified example. It doesn't quite work the same way. Like how do you get words to become pictures? But it, it is a good introductory example that you, you can actually understand. You can take a sentence like, purchase cheap Viagra now. And if, if purchase shows up in a lot of spam, cheap shows up in a lot of spam, and Viagra shows up in a lot of spam, but now is weighted more neutrally because it's, it's a common word that shows up in most, um, most messages or many messages are going to say now at some point then it's weighted very heavily towards spam, so you mark it as spam. And it's it's fairly simple concept to grasp. So take that, now scale it up, and that's, that's what you've got. Um, but it's not intelligence in any sense of the word. There's no intelligence involved. Really, something like stable diffusion, I hate to disappoint you, um, but the way that it works is stable diffusion generates random noise and then it, it basically, to boil it down, it has learned through the training data, it has learned how to, for lack of a better way to explain it, slide the pixels. But it doesn't just slide the pixels in the XY axis, um, it slides the pixels towards certain colors, um, even patterns you could argue, but it learns what um, it learns what those pixels should move towards based on the training data. And the training data were, um, is absorbed by decomposing the pictures to noise. And then the training is uh, brought back out by generating random noise and using the vectors that were computed, this is again a very simplified example, to push those pixels back from random noise into something specific. Um, it, it is not the same thing as the training data. This is a very common mistake that is made. The notion that AI is copying anything is um, frankly completely false. What AI is doing is something similar to what you or I would do. AI is really machine learning, and machine learning is really, in this case, learning how to convert noise to something that's more pleasing to the human eye. So when you show an AI model, when you show it like one thing, one picture, um, or even several of basically the same picture, the thing is going to learn that that's the only picture that exists in the world. That's it. it. It's That's the only picture. So, of course, at that point, it's basically copying. Hang on. Hmm. Oh, I have a cuticle. That was not fun. But, um, while, while it, it learns this one picture, um, that's not the end of the story because you're going to feed it more pictures. The uh, models that we use today, the, the obviously like stable diffusion, they've been trained on millions of images, not hundreds of thousands, but millions. So whenever you type your little prompt and punch your little seeds and blah 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 blah, and and then you get something spit out, it's not a copy. It is the sum of all of the information that was fed to it, basically it learns how to move these pixels around. It's the sum of all that information um, being pushed to its obvious conclusion, <coughs> which is I've learned how to make, how to push noise towards um, curvatures and you know where those curvatures should go and things like that. And it can also be weighted similarly to um, like the Thunderbird spam filter that I described. So I just spent, it looks like 11 minutes or some crap. Um, quite a bit of time though, just explaining that AI isn't AI, it's machine learning. And the reason that I need to do this is all of my thoughts come from this perspective that what we call AI isn't. It is not intelligence. 
If there is no intelligence behind it, it, it's not a human being. It is a computer program. It is a combination of a computer program and effectively a humongous set of tables. Um, that That's not a joke or an exaggeration. That That's pretty much all that AI training data really is. It's a bunch of tables that, you know, for every image fed into it, it clicks those... Um, it, it, it moves that data around a little bit and the tables are the end result. They're, they're the weights for everything, you know. Every image has a pile of words associated with it, so if you type those words it starts pushing towards um, what that image was. And that, that's basically it. But it's not the same thing when it spits out a piece of art as what it was trained on. It is a completely original creation. Arguably, um, whoever punches in whatever prompt and uh, seed and waiting, uh, whatever, all the options, whoever puts all that together, um, I'd strongly disagree, if you watch my video you know this, with the notion that AI art cannot be copyrighted because AI ultimately is machine learning. It's just a computer program. It's a tool. And it's not as trivial as typing like woman with big honkers uh, in blue dress and and voila you get like a, a, a big whopper woman um, you know curvaceous in a blue dress that you can just, just slap up and be like look at this the, this thing I drew that I totally drew you guys and it's um, and it's beautiful finished product yep um, totally yeah that's great it just doesn't work like that a lot of prompts that produce useful art out of AI, well, I need to stop calling it AI, it's machine learning, but um, these machine learning algorithms, a lot of the things that produce useful information from them are things that sp you have to spend a lot of time trying to feed it different information to get it to push things in the correct direction that you want. Um, it's basically like a multi-dimensional soup and you're trying to fish you know, alphabet letters out of it, um, but it could be any number of things. So anyway, that's the AI isn't AI, it's ML speech. Um, we, will, we will be done with that for now, and let me tell you what I think about where we're going with it. While I said all those things, the truth is, AI and machine learning, whatever we call it. I'm going to call it AI just because that's what everybody's come to call it and that's what you understand it as. <coughs> AI is not intelligent. It is not remotely perfect. When it fucks up, it fucks up bad. But, but, one of the downsides is AI is, uh, while not perfect, um, AI is sometimes, many times, shockingly good to, at least to the person evaluating it. Because you have to figure if there's like a set of, say, math equations with a billion possible answers depending on the inputs, um, you know, you, you want, and you want a certain output, you have to find the inputs that match that output. You, it's the same thing with AI. It's like, it, it, it only works when it produces things that humans find pleasing for what the humans are throwing at it. So when it does work, it appears to work so well that you would be misled into thinking it is intelligence. But when it doesn't work, it can be horribly, horribly wrong. One example is and I do not remember all the details, but this was a recent case as of this filming. One example was a woman who lived several states away. <clears throat> um, no, it wasn't a woman, it was a man. And there was this old man lived several states away from uh, some place that got vandalized or, or robbed or something like that. Um, but something bad happened at this, like, restaurant or I don't know and or department store 
But anyway, they took the security footage and they used AI to enhance the security footage. Right off the bat, this is very bad because if you have a camera that makes a recording, the only information that's actually available are the pixels that are stored, which you're talking like you've got a grid of pixels. If you, well, if someone's face is like a 12 by 12 grid of pixels in size in the picture frame on, on the camera, <clears throat> I'm ignoring compression losses, by the way, just for the sake of simplicity, otherwise we'd all go mad. If your face is 12 by 12, then you probably can't see what the hell your face is because just to give you an idea how small 12 by 12 is, your small mouse pointer on Windows, Mac, um, pretty much any computer, your small, normal, you know, unscaled mouse pointer is something like, I think, 32 by 32 pixels or... Um, 32 by 40. It's not, it's not very big, but it's it's definitely not tiny. We're, I'm talking 12 by 12. It's so small um, that even figuring out what it represents could be somewhat difficult. You could put one single letter in there, sure, but if you're tra talking about a person's face, even at full color, um, 12 by 12 pixels is not very good. But what these people did was they took this this face that they couldn't make out, otherwise they wouldn't have had to do this, that they couldn't make out, brought it into AI software, and had the AI software scale up the image and generate a face. Oh man, my neck is real stiff tonight. Generate a face. They AI machine learning cannot it cannot pull more data out of the data that's there. That's not how that works. It cannot magically create more data than what's already present. Or rather, it can't magically pull more valid data out of it. If you've ever heard of the term quantization, that's where in computing, um, specifically, you sample something like audio or a pixel and it has a certain range of values <clears throat> that range of values is higher than what you're able to represent so you you have a smaller range so you mentally here stretch that range out and then there's like markers along the way for each value you can represent and whichever value it's closer to when you overlap this, that's what you move it to. But if if the original is somewhere in between two values of what you are capable of storing, like if you can only represent zero through three, but the data that's coming in can be zero through seven, well, that's eight possibilities instead of four. So what if the value is five? Well, there's no way to bring five down to fit in half the space. It would be 2.5. So it's either got to be two or three. That's a quantization loss. When you go from two and a half, if you were to examine it in, in floating point, decimal, whatever, in, in, in the larger space, <clears throat> relative to the smaller one, it's got to go one way or the other. So you're choosing to throw away half the data there. And you don't have a choice. You can't store it in the smaller space otherwise. That's the problem with this, this thing where you take the camera and you AI extrapolate a face out of it. So they managed to extrapolate, um, using AI, a face that looked like this old man that had never been to this state and lived several states away, who got arrested and prison raped at knife point. And then a few days later, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah we, we verified your alibi, everything's fine. You know, you can go home, You, yeah, okay. If you want more information on that, Nate the Lawyer did a video on it, and uh, I don't remember what it's called, I'm sorry, but that's one example of AI, <clears throat> that's not even a false positive, frankly, um, that's an example of AI just being abused. Uh, by the way, the reason that the AI image was accepted by the police and the reason they went ahead and arrested the guy, it was because the employee who did the enhancement using AI 
just said that, yeah, that's what we got. And didn't tell the police that they'd used AI to make up an image. You know, because if you did that, the police might have gone, oh, oh, so you basically, like, <clears throat> just created a face out of nowhere. You just, like, like took a, a set of pixels and just ma manufactured a face from them. Uh, out of pixels that you couldn't make a face out in originally. Yeah, that's not going to hold up in court, buddy. So that's AI being abused. Just That's a person abusing the tool. That's not even AI's fault. That is the person's fault. But that's one really scary aspect of this, is that people will abuse it, and even worse, <clears throat> people will trust it. See, because... There are two possibilities with that employee. Either the employee thought that the AI that he was using produced a valid result and naively handed it over saying, yeah, this is the guy. Or, and I always lean in this direction, the guy didn't have that faith in it. He just obfuscated it and he was like, oh yeah, look what I did. And he knew what he was doing. He knew that the AI was making shit up, but he did it anyway. So that would be malicious. Look, I solved the problem. Give me credit. Never mind the fact that my abuse of this tool got an old man who was completely innocent uh, extradited across several states and prison raped. You know, now, don't worry about that part. That's, that part's not a big deal. Uh, you know what? You know what I really hate about driving? It's when you're in a lane and you can't get over because this other guy won't get out of the way. Driving sucks. Now, I wonder... Ooh, that guy's in a friggin' BMW Roadster. I wonder if the state troopers are, part, are positioned up here like they often are make for an interesting evening on the old rolling rambles, huh? Also, it looks like God is at my back, doesn't it? I have a really nice built-in hair light on this thing. So, that's just one dystopian use, and I feel like that's kind of the, like, bottom of the barrel, baseline, minimum, lowest sort of um, bad use of AI or um, bad direction we're going with it. But let's let's move further with this. We we have security cameras everywhere. We have facial recognition software. Facial recognition is not an exact science for exactly the reason that I just mentioned. You're taking a picture. A picture is inherently limited. So unless, unless you've got a really high quality camera and the guy's sticking his face right up in it and the lighting is good and everything, you're going to have an inherently limited data set to start from and you're trying <coughs> to find similarities between what limited data you have and a database of faces that you know. Well, with AI, what happens is you start training the AI you know, this, you, you got it right, you got it wrong. And remember what I said about how sometimes AI gets it right and it's scary good, but when it gets it wrong, it often gets it horribly wrong. Now, obviously, if you've got a picture of something and then you've got this face that completely doesn't look like it, then it's going to be caught as a false positive. But what I'm worried about are all the false positives that will never, ever be caught, that no one will ever know. Oh, we have you on tape. How do you know it's me? Well, we used facial recognition to find out it was you. <coughs> okay. And when you go to court, this software, this facial recognition AI, that doesn't work based on analyzing hard traits that it can concretely identify, but instead does the same kind of thing as stable diffusion in reverse. You know, basically teach it how to weigh noise. If it gets it wrong, what are you gonna do? I mean, the computer says it. 
I mean, it, I feel like this is the same thing as that notion back in the 70s and 80s. Well, the computer says it, and computers never make mistakes, except with this AI thing, because it looks like it can basically perform miracles. It, it, sometimes the results appear to be that good. People will become even more trusting of it than they were with computers back in the 80s. And it's not good to trust anything like that, especially if we're dealing with things like evidentiary standards. You know, frankly, <laughs> I think that the only time that AI is valid as any kind of a law enforcement tool is as a starting point, much like how an observational scientific study is, er, an observational study is only a starting point to form a hypothesis for a scientific study that with the proper controls and everything. So AI is a good starting point to sift through a huge amount of data more quickly to find possibilities to manually review. But the problem comes when you drop that manual review part. When you stop having a person take the starting point and then everything is actually examined by a human being that can make decisions you know based on years of experience and well just looking at two pictures side by side you remove the human from the starting point and you let the computer take over more of it which is inevitable because that's how bureaucracy works so we could cut costs by having the computer just identify the suspects for us instead of just assuming that everybody they identify is a starting point to find suspects, we can just assume that anybody the computer identifies is probably responsible. And it all goes downhill from there. I can see that going poorly. Uh, social media, same thing. Censorship. You can already see it on YouTube. In fact, YouTube, <coughs> I would say YouTube is the, the ultimate in AI censorship failure. Because while I'm sure that if you're trying to censor so-called hate uh, or mean, really mean comments or whatever, I'm sure that it's effective. But at the same time, this AI that censors hate and racism and all this other stuff that perhaps legitimately breaks the terms of service. We can get into my free speech philosophy some other time, but for all the things it finds and blocks that are correct, there are way too many things that it finds and blocks that are legitimate attempts at having a genuine, adult, level-headed discussion, a rational discussion or debate. And it's, it's embarrassing, frankly, how bad it is. Um, I have my own comments on my own videos get shadow banned or deleted entirely just because YouTube doesn't like it. Just because the YouTube AI decides, no. Nah. Um, once uh, Facebook, I, I replied to a friend. Now this is a this is a post my friend made. We're we're joking back and forth in comments on my post, and it's just a conversation between two people. And Facebook suspends me for like a week because I said something about uh, liking to um, eat. Like, I like to eat babies and, you know, something dumb. Something that anybody should really know is just a joke. I was just being silly. Um, I don't remember the text of it anymore, but they decided to penalize me for saying what I said. And what I said was not legitimate hate. It was pretty easy to determine that it wasn't. Uh, it was pretty damn obvious, and yet... And, and, I'm fairly certain that on this private post, neither myself nor my friend reported what I wrote to Facebook for an enforcement action, which means Facebook proactively did it. And that's the other part of the problem. You put too much trust into these algorithms, this, the, especially AI-style algorithms that don't just look at known um, like known phrases that can be a problem or whatever like and pass it on to manual reviewers 
you trust the AI to do the work for you with no oversight. And then you get the brilliant idea to start making it proactive instead of having it just like process reports. Oh no, let's scan every post. Let's scan every comment, every video, everything. Everything on the entire website. Let's run it through this AI auto banning scanner thing. I remember once Amazon, um, they had these reviews. People were getting paid by companies to leave, basically leave five-star reviews for their products and they would disclose in their reviews I was compensated by the company for the um, or whatever to give a fair and unbiased review. So I started putting at the end of my reviews to differentiate them. I was not given money by the company to uh, give any review. Everything I've said is entirely because I bought it. Well, because I mirrored the language, but I put the word didn't in front of it, just mirroring the language was enough for them to decide, okay, he's one of them. And my reviews got deleted. And when I went back to the product to try and put the review back, they said, we're sorry, you're not allowed to review this product at this time. So I got pissed off and uh, I deleted all of my reviews on all of the products because if they're not going to, you know, if they're going to do something that stupid, if they're going to nuke what I had to say, then why should I? Why should I leave up any of that work that I did for them for free? Why should I do it for free? I'm going to nuke it all. Kind of the same thing with Reddit. Reddit decided to be a cancerous hole, so I deleted four years worth of contributions, and uh, this is what I think about it. Reddit really is kind of cancerous. But anyway, the biggest problem with AI is trust. People trusting it because it seems to do a good job. And the problem is you can never test every possible scenario. And when it makes a mistake, it's going to be a bad mistake. And the more power you give it, the bigger of a mistake you get, you're dealing with. I think that, I think that the the most important thing in the future, in the near future especially, <clears throat> with artificial intelligence as they call it, is going to be making sure, I mean, what we really need are the corner cases to come up and prove that the AI is not good, that it is not infallible, that it doesn't do as good of a job as people may be misled into thinking it does. It does not do a good job. It just, AI is it's not capable of doing as good of a job as it initially looks. Yeah, you can look at AI art and be like, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. You just typed some words into a box and that came out of it? That's that's astonishing. How can I get, how can I get access to that? You you might start there and start building trust in the thing. But I tell you, if you spend a little bit of time at, at an AI image prompt and just key in random things you'd be interested in having it spit out and you see some of the stuff it comes up with, you'll never trust it to uh, hand out parking tickets or you know, pass judgment on people based on what they say in court or, or you know, you, you would not trust AI if you just used it enough yourself. Unfortunately, and this is where things get real dark, large companies are attempting to create this notion of so-called responsible AI. And anytime you see something like responsible, well, what do you mean responsible? There's a whole lot that's not included in that. There are a whole lot of questions that I have now that are not answered yet by your notion of responsible artificial intelligence. Like, what do you mean? How, how, how do we create a responsible artificial intelligence? What is meant by responsible? Well, you might say responsible as in the AI should not generate white supremacist content or hate content or whatever. But hey man, it's an AI. What are you training it on? How did it learn that in the first place? You know, think about this. If th this notion that AI should be responsible, what you're really saying, what they're really saying when they say that, they tell the government we need AI regulation, they're saying put laws in place that require that AI, that require that 
algorithms not be allowed to be used in certain ways that disagree with our politics and coincidentally our companies are the only companies big enough and with enough money to be able to navigate around the red tape that we're asking you to put up and be able to reliably fall in line. Because if I have a startup, if I have an AI startup, <clears throat> my AI is not going to be as good as, as their AI is at filtering out the stuff, the free speech, that the government has now decided to censor. But the problem is that it doesn't matter what the truth is, it doesn't matter what your ideals are, what matters is enforcement. What matters is if the laws on the books aren't valid but they're still enforced, well, well does it matter that they're not valid? These big companies are trying to create the notion of responsible AI so that they can cut out all of their competition. They want it to be an oligopoly where you and I do not have AI. They want to put AI cloud features in everything. Microsoft wants their stupid Bing AI nonsense in their Android keyboards or launchers or whatever, you know, Google, same thing, AI. They want you to rely on their cloud AI, <clears throat> but you'll notice there's not much of a rush to get any of you any kind of access to offline user runnable standalone AI tools that you can have on your own computer independently of any of these big companies. Where's that? Even though a lot of people are getting into the whole AI art thing at this point, um, <clears throat> there are fairly simple installers. They're still not perfect, but there are installers to get started with some of this stuff. It's mostly just aimed at the art stuff. Any other AI stuff, yeah, I hope you're a big data scientist, buddy, because you're not going to get into that field. It, it's, it's not at, at all accessible. The only way that these tools are accessible to a normal human being, um, even a technically proficient normal human being like me 20 years ago, the only access that you have to them is through large multi-million or multi-billion dollar, often international, corporate conglomerates. Humongous, very powerful entities that already have so much power over you. Where's your AI? And I'm aware they're trying to put these support chip things that, these, these various supporting um, elements in processors and future computers to accelerate AI. But it's not to accelerate AI in that your computer, you can have it all run on your computer. It's to accelerate the processing so that they can do some of the processing work on your computer, but then send it back up to Microsoft or Google or whoever's cloud AI crap instead. Once again, you are being deprived of access to the tools. It's, it's almost like you're a carpenter and you want to hammer nails to do what you do, there's, um, there's this like nail gun and you can use it, but you can't actually like hold the nail gun. You have to pay this other guy something, throw a few bucks at this other guy who actually owns the nail gun, and then fires the nails where you tell him to, the way that you tell him to, and you have no control of the nail gun directly. And if that guy just, just decides to, you know, walk off and, and not help you anymore or dies or something, well, I mean, it goes with him. The nail gun goes with him. So this advanced technology, you're left with a hammer. Well, advanced nail gun guy, you know, does whatever he wants. Oh, oh, you've gotten used to it? You built our advanced nail gun into your business, well now you need to pay us an exorbitant fee because you're locked into our proprietary nail gun system, our proprietary AI, much like how Amazon Web Services locks you into their servers. Um, you're locked into a proprietary platform you have no control over. 
it is essentially uh, the, these these big tech companies have set up all of these different sinks where you show up needing something and they control all the somethings so you have to pick one of them but any one of them that you pick you get locked in and you start sinking into the pit it's um it's essentially technical indentured servitude if you really think about it we are slowly but surely becoming slaves to large tech companies Neither Democrats nor Republicans are going to do anything to actually deal with it or stop it. They will, however, happily pass bills behind closed doors in special sessions during holidays when nobody's paying attention or during Super Bowl or some other thing. They pulled that crap, by the way, recently. They passed all but the border control part of that Ukraine funding bill during the Super Bowl in a special session when everybody was paying attention to the game. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that, did you? You can't trust these people in government to do anything other than scratch the corporate donors' backs. They are not going... You can't vote your way out of this. Something has to be done on a mass scale. I have some ideas. I don't know that all of them are legal, but I'll go over those in another video. For now, um, I think I should cut those thoughts off. Um, I've talked long enough. I'm already going to have to edit this stupid thing down because I mumbled and bumbled too much. So... I hope you've enjoyed everything I've said. I would love to hear what you think down below. As usual, you know the, the drill, like, comment, subscribe. If you feel like it, throw me a tip. There are options down below. PayPal's the best one because they take the smallest cut. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think. I'm really curious. Have a wonderful uh, whatever time of day it is where you are. We'll see you later.